stop is where Hatchery is here and this is the Copper River from here and that is Copper River. That is just enough where we started our work on. This is Gokana in the winter. It's I think it gets to about I think it's about 50 below.
life cycle of the acidic sand, so from an egg to albin, and the bones of the albin in its egg sac. So when it hatches, it, it then hides in the gravel and eats its egg sac. And when, it's, and when it comes out, then you multiply, and then for about one, to, one or two years, the sockeye salmon, all the timings differ for each salmon, but sockeye stay in the lake for about one to one or two years, and they go to sea for about at least three or four years, and they return as adults, and they spawn and they die. Uh, Atlantic salmon uh, have almost the same life cycle, but they don't, they don't die immediately after spawning. They can return to up to four times and spawn again. So the Gulkana hatchery, the Gulkana hatchery, the Gulkana hatchery um, grows its fish from an egg to a fry. And they're in those incubators. But most, most, of, most of the and then they put the fry, and they see the fry into one of three, into three lakes near the hatchery. So two of the hatcheries, two of the lakes can be reached by road, but one of them, Crossman's Lake, where they've got the four, I think it's ten million fry, they, there's no lake, so they put the fry into a crop duster, which is that plane, and they fly it 250 feet over the lake and spray out the fry <laughs> over two days. <coughs> And it has to be 250 feet up because if it's too high, then the gills dry out, and if it's too low, they, uh, the water doesn't atomize and go in, and the, the fry hit the water along with all the water that they were sitting in veins, and they, they get hit too hard and they die. So it took them several tries to work it out. <laughs> So 
when you when you when the hatcheries change the water temperature or other things in the fish's environment up and down in a pattern, that pattern shows up on the other end. So it, it looks a little like a barcode when you look at looked at on a microscope. And the, the most hatcheries use thermal marking. So they vary the temperature by about four degrees in different pat in different patterns for each breed of fish for each hatchery. And, and they often they change it each year. So by looking at Oblip, you can tell the age of the salmon, the breed of the salmon, and what hatchery it came from. Some hatcheries also dry out the eggs, which the leaves also leaves a mark. But the kind of hatchery, yeah. so when they're, when they're eggs, the local hatchery doesn't want to dry them out because some eggs are because the stock eggs are more vulnerable. I'm not sure that that's yet for sure. But when most hatcheries heat up the water by doing, changing the temperature, some take it, they don't either heat it up or they take they pipe in water from the top and the bottom of the lake and then they mix that to get the right temperature. But the kind of hatchery doesn't have large lakes nearby and it doesn't have enough electricity to heat water. So instead, they use a, a kind of marking called strontium marking, strontium chloride, and they, they pour strontium chloride in, into the uh, incubators when the salmon are still, uh, still fry. So that leaves a mark on the other. And this picture is not actually of hatchery salmon, it's of wild fry near Cordova. Is by Thomas Time. So this the line here, this line, is the, the mark of a of strontium on an offer as seen under a electron scanning microscope. And these lines here is the code of a of a, of a thermal mark of it. So it's it's obviously it's very definite line. It's obviously not a hard fish. The trouble with strontium marking is it needs an electron microscope, yeah, which are very large, and the because the mark is much smaller, and the thermal marking of the reds only needs a compound microscope. And this picture is actually from the Oculus lab in Cordova, the space data. And so they can look at they can take the from the fish and look at them right away if they need to. But Strontium mark of this need to be sent all the way to the University of Fairbanks and so they can be right with their electron scanning microscope. It's much more difficult and more expensive than the compound microscope. So the reason they do all this, all this work, is, is uh, also to show, to tell the difference, to, to, to see how many of the hatchery fish and wild fish are in the a commercial fishing boat, fishing catch. <coughs> the purpose of a hatchery is to balance out variations in the natural wild run and to compensate for the lack of fish if the, run is, if the wild run is bad. It doesn't always work because the fish have to return to the hatchery, but it's more, it is a more reliable thing. So, but the also the also the, another reason that they need hatcheries is because the wild run wouldn't probably would here wouldn't be able to support their full commercial fishing fishery by itself. There used to be many many salmon all over the world, but they, their numbers have been going down, um, mostly due to Loss of their habitat loss. So these two streams are both good salmon streams, they're quite wide and they're quite deep. Also overhanging vegetation has protection. But that sort of stream is becoming rarer and rarer as people build more dams and all the rivers are poisoned by chemicals, towns or river. And there was actually going to be a dam on the I mean, New England, 
there used to be, you, every river used to be filled with salmon. But now they've dammed, most, they've dammed many of them, or there are now so many towns that these rivers can't hold, can't play salmon anymore. But uh, in 1974, there are actually plans to make a dam on the scale of Grand Coulee Dam on the, river, on the Columbia River. There are plans to make a uh, dam on that scale in, on the Copper River, but it was the plans were stopped when they took the fish wheels that we saw and the castings on the our rafting today. They moved them to another part of the river, and they found that enough salmon were coming up from the proposed side of the dam unspawned, so they cancelled plans for the dam. Which is very fortunate because otherwise they probably wouldn't have been much of a commercial fishery if they now close it down. And another threat to salmon is ocean acidification, which is when fossil fuels, when fossil fuels are burned, they let off carbon dioxide, CO2, which goes into the atmosphere and then into the air. But the ocean absorbs CO2 quite easily, so which buffers the rest of the world from the effects of rising CO2. But the rising CO2 um, makes the ocean more acidic, and which stops the pteropods from forming their shells. And pteropods are about 45% of the diet of pink salmon. So lots of the pteropods would be Thank you to the sponsor of the Chris Trip and to Thomas Stein, Kenneth Wilkerson and Patrick Endes for letting me use their photos. Does anyone have any questions for Helen? surprised you the most about this study you did? Probably the thing I was most surprised by was that they considered that they were going to build a dam in Copper for that reason. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was surprising. I was, quite, I was very surprised when I learned about it. How do you think it will go on? Do you think that I'm not sure. I suppose it depends on how people treat them. If they make rules to keep rivers clean and they'll overfish them, then they could so then they could still be there in a hundred years. But if they overfish them and down with the rivers, then they will all be. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit more about the program in general? And like the float trip or what you learned or what surprised you about the whole trip rather than just what you focused on for your project? <laughs> well, the trip down the river, when we were on the up river, we took the ferry to the Valdez and then drove up up to Chicken. But um, then we just we got kind of hatchery and to it there. But a lot of the trip was focused on looking after the watershed and sand. So we as we went down we visited quite a few sites. We visited the sonar station and the bared fish wheels um, on, on our way down. And visited there and talked to the people there and learned about sand there. And we did uh, as well as a few projects on fisheries and learned about fishery management. And, and we, when we were in Cordova, we uh, went to seal, uh, help with the dusky goose nests, by making their nests on the Now. So it was, mo it was mostly, the, whole, the trip was mostly focused on 
learning, learning about the watershed and learning how to look after it. And hopefully uh, in the future, take care. How many people are on your trip? No, uh, 14 of the students. 13. 13 students. And then an equal number of adults. <laughs> Learn being a landscape moss from the watershed project. And there was, on the river, there were also, I think it was eight river, river rides who were running, but we were running the rafts. Who tried to row the rafts, but Helen rowed the most of the time. I think they wanted to steal Helen to row the rafts for them. <laughs> yeah, they did that, they did that, us row the rafts. <laughs> How many rafts were there? There was six rafts. So six rafts. The longest was 18 feet and the shortest was 14 feet. So was so quite big. There were, yeah, quite a flotilla over there. <laughs> were the, the kids from upriver surprised that, uh, did they not know much about fishing or did they? Well, what, uh, one of the girls had a, had a fish wheel. And quite a lot of them had done uh, sport fishing. I don't think anyone had done any of them had done commercial fishing. Yeah, very different views it was, it was on fishing different. from the upriver to the downriver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The very old and different from upriver. So the river himself, it's running smoothly or it's quite wide? It was, most of the time it was very, very wide. Yeah. So it was, or it was, I won a couple times and also went through, were near to um, Malastasia. There were some small rapids, but they were, they were always quite small. It was, it was usually very flat. I w what I was surprised about was that there was usually a wind going up there. Mm -hmm. So you had to go to row against the wind. I sort of expected you to float down the river and push a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were a little bit direct. 